So we're meeting today on the matter of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses for today's meeting. From Alternatives, it's Ferro uh, Mehdi, the program officer, by video conference. We also have from Human Rights Watch, Maya Wang, the acting China director, also by video conference. And from Tibet Action Institute, Ladon Tethong, the director. Uh, you'll note that uh, Madam Wang is uh, appearing with the camera off. Uh, that is by her request. And so I'm sure we'll all understand some of the reasons why for that. So we now have uh, an opportunity for each of our witnesses to present up to five minutes of opening comments. And we'll begin with uh, Mr. Mehdi. Mr. Mehdi, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm not an expert on Canada People's Republic of China relations, uh, but I'm here to speak of another country which is integral to Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, and namely India. In the pursuit of containing China, we are deeply concerned that Canada might turn a blind eye to a deeply distressing human rights situation in India, as well as the erosion of its pillars of democracy, including the legislature, the judiciary, and the free press. Canada must stand against the erosion of rights and democracy in India, irrespective of its China policy, because a compromised India at war with itself cannot make a reliable partner in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I would just like to mention that the written submission which I have made has many references which have been hyperlinked. The most severe threat that I see on the horizon is the possibility of mass violence. India is home to over 200 million Muslims. Continued escalation of hate speech, home demolitions, as well as calls for ethnic cleansing and genocide raise the specter of horrific mass violence in the subcontinent. Genocide Watch and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum have both declared India at risk of mass violence. Prime Minister Modi has very recently made openly Islamophobic remarks, calling all India Muslims, and I quote, infiltrators during his national election campaigning just last month. And by a very large majority, the European Parliament adopted a resolution last year on July 13th, warning against the existence of, I quote, Hindu majoritarianism in India. The resolution calls on the Indian government to put a rapid end to the ongoing ethnic and religious violence. The European Parliament thus joins a worldwide movement denouncing growing authoritarianism and human rights violations in India. Even more recently, last month on April 23rd, the U.S. State Department in its human rights report has flagged a dozen different kinds of human rights abuses in India, including extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances, arbitrary arrest or detention, torture to coerce confessions, repeated imposition of internet shutdowns, and blocked telecommunications, surveillance of civil society activists, trolling of human rights defenders, punishment of family members for alleged offenses by a relative. And according to the Human Rights Watch India Country Report 2022, the BJP, that is the ruling, uh, uh, ruling party in the government, as a majority government, has continued its systematic discrimination and stigmatization of religious and other minorities particularly Muslims. BJP supporters have increasingly committed violent attacks on targeted groups. The government's Hindu majority ideology was reflected in prejudice in institutions, including the judiciary and constitutional authorities, such as the National Human Rights Commission. The authorities have intensified their efforts to silence civil society activists and independent journalists using politically motivated criminal charges, including terrorism to imprison those who denounce or criticize government abuses. The BJP government's implementation of the Citizenship Amendment Act in 2019 
is a blatant example of discriminatory legislation providing a pathway to Indian citizenship for non-Muslim migrants from neighboring countries while excluding Muslims. According to the Reporters Without Borders Asia Pacific report, I quote, violence against journalists, politically partisan media, and concentration of media ownership demonstrate that press freedom is in crisis in the world's largest democracy, governed since 2014 by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. We call upon the government of Canada to use every international forum at its disposal to hold India accountable. Now, for instance, India is currently undergoing its Financial Action Task Force Mutual Evaluation Review. Canada has an opportunity to hold India to account for misuse of FATF recommendations and misuse of anti-terror laws to target civil society and political opposition. Mr. Mahdi, Multiple... I'm wondering if we could ask you to wrap up your comment now because uh, you've gone your five minutes. Sure, can I just take 30 more seconds to wrap up? Mr. Chair, we also believe that people-to-people -people dialogue through civil society organizations between Canada and India is important to share ideas and views on human rights situation in the countries and our government should think of investing in this process. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now go to uh, Ms. Wang. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, it is my pleasure to speak with you this evening. I hope you're all well. Um, I, for, I'm Maya Wang, and I'm the Acting China Director at Human Rights Watch, and I've worked 17 years tracking human rights abuses in China, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong. First of all, I would like to also, um, you know, agree with Mr. Mahdi that I think in um, the efforts to address um, China, um, I think it's very important not to lose sight of um, the, the growing abuses in places like India, uh, which Human Rights Watch also documents. Um, but going back to China, um, more than a decade um, into President Xi Jinping's rule, um, the Chinese government has very significantly deepened repression across the country. Um, in Xinjiang, um, the authorities have committed, as you know, crimes against humanity, which include mass detention, forced labor, cultural per persecution, and widespread surveillance throughout the region. Hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs and other Turkey Muslims remain arbitrarily imprisoned as a result of this strike hard campaign, um, many of them for, um, you know, imprisoned for everyday lawful behavior. They're imprisoned for things like engaging in basic religious activities, such as praying or having recit recitations of the Quran on their cell phones. The average sentence for these kind of behavior is 12 and a half years. As to the situation in Tibet, I'll leave it to my um, co-speaker, my colleague after me, um, Laden, um, who will elaborate. In Hong Kong, the authorities have erased long protected basic civil and political rights after Beijing imposed a draconian national security law on the city in 2020. The government has also taken rapid fire steps since then to eliminate the pro-democracy movement, the free press, arresting over 10,000 people for their involvement in the 2019 protest, and has just imposed a second security law on the city known as Article 23 in March just this year. Throughout China, the Chinese government has tightened its already vice-like grip on society. I don't think I need to explain just how I mean, different ways the Chinese government, um, you know, using um, the law, using security forces to, you know, keep control over society. But just for a simple example, now expressing pessimism about the state of the economy right now can be punishable as an act endangering state security. Given this worsening environment um, of human rights situation in China, here is what we think the Canadian government should do. First of all, words do matter. Um, we shouldn't be fatigued by the fact that China, is, the Chinese government is deeply abusive, that we, we, we should take words very seriously. We urge the Canadian government to publicly express concerns about the Chinese government's human rights violations at the highest level. Um, it um, should urge the Chinese government to end crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. Let's not forget that. Words alone are not enough. They should be backed by concrete actions. Otherwise, we all know the Chinese government would consider um, words just paper tiger. In Hong Kong, for example, um, the Canadian government should impose targeted sanctions 
on rights abusing Chinese and Hong Kong officials after Article 23 was just enacted. While we appreciate the Canadian Parliament's decision to resettle 10,000 at-risk Uyghurs, we also appreciate Canada's ban on forced labour, but we fear the current ban and these actions are not enough. We recommend that you adopt laws such as a presumption against imports from Xinjiang similar to the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act in the United States to address Chinese government-sponsored forced labour throughout the region. We also recommend that you pass a due diligence law requiring companies to address human rights abuses in their supply chain in Xinjiang and elsewhere. Finally, Canada should also act to address transnational repression by the Chinese government in Canada. We recommend that the Canadian government to encourage universities to track instances of direct or indirect Chinese government harassment, surveillance, or threats on campuses. It should assist universities to report annually the number and nature of these kind of incidents and take other measures that can protect academic freedom on campus. We also recommend that the Canadian government conduct a review regarding um, the government agencies monitoring and response to Chinese government-backed harassment and intimidation in Canada, meet regularly with communities and individuals affected, and hold accountable people who harass and intimidate others in Canada for views critical of the Chinese government. Thank you, and I look very much forward to your questions and discussion tonight. Thank you, Ms. Wang. Now uh, to uh, uh, Leon Tethong, uh, Director of the Tibet Action Institute. You have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today and um, uh, represent Tibetans, and also I am a Tibetan Canadian. Um, my father was born in a free and independent Tibet in 1934. My brother was born in the Tibetan refugee camp in South India, and I was born on the traditional land of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations in Victoria on Vancouver Island. As a Tibetan Canadian, I have to say I welcome the announcement of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy uh, last year for numerous reasons, but most significantly because it brings into the light some critical truths about the People's Republic of China that Tibetans have all that have Tibetans have known all along, and that we need the world to recognize if we are to successfully navigate the clear and present danger. Uh, threat that the PRC poses to peace and security in our world. The first, of course, is that the PRC is an expansionist power. This is something Tibetans learned the hard way a long time ago with China's invasion and occupation of our nation in 1950. And it was the very first act of aggression and annexation carried out by the newly formed Communist government of the People's Republic of China. The second truth is that the Chinese Communist Party does not in any way share the values that Tibetans, Canadians, and so many others around the world hold dear, especially respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Tibetans have lived without fundamental rights or freedoms since 1959, uh, and some years and decades have been worse than others, depending on who may have been in power at the moment uh, in China. But ultimately, the CCP is the CCP and has been ruling over Tibetan people with the most vicious iron fist for all these decades. Just these past five years alone, Tibet's been ranked as the least free place on earth in uh, Freedom House's uh, very high profile global ranking on civil and political liberties. And today, at least one million Tibetan children between the ages of four and 18 years old are living in a system of colonial boarding schools in Tibet. This means that at least three out of every four uh, school-aged children are living their lives separated from their parents and families in state-run residential schools that are specially designed to isolate them and to erase their Tibetan identity and also replace it with a hyper-nationalist Chinese identity. The final truth uh, I want to talk about is that the PRC does, government does not engage with the international community like the UN or through political or trade associations or agreements because it wants to promote mutual prosperity for the betterment of all people or because it wants to be friends with and learn from our democratic leaders and our democratic models, but rather because it engages in these um, ways because it wants to learn how best to dominate and control these spaces and ultimately how to remake them to serve its own interests and purposes, ultimately for its own benefit. 
This has been most obvious for Tibetans watching China at the UN all these years where PRC leaders and delegations do nothing but lie through their teeth and paint a picture of life in Tibet in particular that's completely devoid from any on the ground reality. And while all these truths about the nature of the PRC government, I know paint a very bleak and distressing picture, uh, I think it's critical also to recognize one other truth that I believe speaks to hope for the future. Xi Jinping and the CCP are unelected and therefore they have no real legitimacy to lead the Chinese people. And they've held power until now by ruthlessly suppressing any and all opposition and dissent. And uh, also because they have delivered some measure of economic prosperity. But from what we can tell now and what many experts are saying, this is ending. And it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Xi Jinping's totalitarian rule, uh, failing economic policies, and paranoid political maneuvering have created deep discord and division within the CCP. And in particular, widespread suffering under China's very harsh zero COVID policies and the sudden lifting of their restrictions undermined Xi Jinping's legitimacy and generated an understanding, especially amongst young people, as seen in the white paper protest, that the CCP does not have the capability to lead and does not what have what China needs now um, in terms of a future for with freedom and democracy. We believe that taking a, a strong public stand uh, and a principled stand on Tibet and on human rights more broadly uh, will tell people inside China uh, and beyond what Canada truly values. And though the CCP leaders and won't take kindly to such messages, we recognize that Xi Jinping and the CCP are not the future. <laughs> The future actually lies with young people, workers, and the legions of human rights defenders who are suffering, dissatisfied, and hungry for change. And the future also lies with Tibetans who share bas basic values with Canadians. Uh, Ms. Song, Canada I, has a I, long I, history of... Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. I wonder if you could wrap up. Uh, you've gone past your five minutes, okay? Thank you. Yes. Canada has a long history of supporting human rights in Tibet and the aspirations of Tibetan people. Uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is one of only seven honorary Canadian citizens, and uh, all that Tibetans and he stands for in terms of peace, compassion, democracy, justice, these are the fundamental values uh, that Canada has uh, stated to support and also uh, I think are core to peace and security in the world as is the Indo-Pacific strategy. And so what we would ask is that Minister Jolie on behalf of the government of Canada speak out publicly against the colonial boarding school system in Tibet, echo the recommendations made by UN human rights experts calling on China to abolish the system, also further impose sanctions against the architects of the boarding school system. Um, because this would have a huge impact on for accountability and for Tibetan parents and educators on the ground inside Tibet. And also we need the government of Canada make, to make very strong and clear public statements and work with like-minded partners and allies to make it clear that Tibetans decide who the next Dalai Lama is. Tibetans have been managing this process for a half a millennium and the government of the PRC has no role in this matter, no matter how desperate they may be for one, because this process belongs to the religious leadership uh, of uh, Tibet and the people that His Holiness the Dalai Lama entrusts and no one else. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to our rounds of questioning. So we'll begin with Mr. Chong for six minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today we're talking about human rights, uh, whether it's re in respect of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, people of Hong Kong, people in Tibet, Muslims, and other minorities throughout the Indo-Pacific region. And so my first question for all three panelists is, which, which peer democracy of Canada's do you think has the best practices in terms of advancing uh, human rights in the Indo-Pacific region? You know, what, what country do you think is doing this in a way uh, that's most effective in the region among the peer democracies uh, that Canada is associated with? Well, I'll start with one of the, th you know, uh, Ms. Mr. Mehdi. We'll start with Mr. Mehdi and then Ms. Uh, Ms. Wang and then Ms. Uh, Tethong. Uh, well, it's a good question. I, I don't uh, know which country to identify who is promoting. Uh, if that is the question, Mr. Chair, the, the democracy or democratic institutions in India today, uh, 
uh, but there are, uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, uh, European Parliament parliamentarians which had passed a resolution uh, highlighting the, the the abuse of of human rights in India, or institutions like USCIRF. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Rates... Messi. I'm wondering if you could uh, turn your camera on, please, sir. Oh, sorry about that. All right. You can leave your camera on. Just mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Okay, great. Thank you. So, yeah, there are institutions which uh, which are testing and promoting uh, the Indian democratic institutions, but so far, uh, nothing concretely has been done in India, as far as I know. Thank you. Um. I, I think that's a very difficult question um, because I think there is basically no perfect um, policies, I think, on human rights, especially because we see previous, you know, in a different era, in the era of essentially, quote, engagement with China, um, you know, human rights issues get um, pushed very much down the hierarchy, prioritizing economic engagement with China. And now I think with this era, we, we see national security now being the top line um, priority in many governments and human rights again, although it's being talked about, but a lot of the policies are not really about promoting um, human rights. I think it's a lot about competition, which I think there are some, you know, understandable reasons for that. Um, nonetheless, um, I think using human rights as an instrument to compete rather than um, promoting them as a value also to speak to people inside China, to give them the strength and support they need. Ultimately, they are the people who would change China for the better, um, is a short-sighted way of seeing it. However, if you really have to push me, what kind of policies have been good in terms of or better when it comes to China and human rights. I would probably put some of the European Union's, you know, laws and, and uh, you know, that has to do with you know, uh, due diligence that recently got passed or, um, uh, you know, forced labor on forced labor. Those, although watered down, I think some of them, to be kind of more, um, have, have the ability to, to deal with these issues in a more um, comprehensive manner that um, includes China, um, although we would like to see some of the legislation more like the, the Uyghur uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act that's specifically about Xinjiang. So there's no kind of um, good model, except I would encourage two things. So one is that we are at an age where I think political leaders have to stand up for human rights because these are important. If we don't, I, I think we're going to come into a very difficult era globally. Uh, number two is that we must hold the Chinese government accountable in an equal manner. Um, and that is not to be used just for, um, I think, you know, scoring political points. So. All right, Ms. Uh, Tethong, if you wish to weigh in. Yeah, I don't know that I would say which one is doing it best. I don't know enough to say. I, I, what I would say is that the I think the key for a healthy democracy and for upholding the um, uh, human rights and the rule of law is really in, uh, can be seen best through strong support for civil society and for movements. Um, I think the best way to counter authoritarianism in the world is, is the rise of authoritarian, authoritarian governments and powers in the world is to support and invest in people's movements. Um, and I think uh, that needs to happen more, uh, considering the you know the the now uh, total crackdown on what was some space for civil society in China until recently. I think that um, you know there has to be yeah just more of an investment made in people's movements, student movements. Uh, uh, support for space for these groups to get together to organize to share lessons and skills and you know that's that ultimately is i i think the most the best way to promote and protect um democracy uh, okay. and to con counter authoritarianism thank you mr chong your time has expired sir oh, yes, i'll go thank to you. mr oliphant for six minutes or less thank you uh, mr chair and thanks to all the witnesses and uh thanks to mr chong
for his question because it was basically what I was going to ask around uh, best practices of other countries. And I, I find the, the answers interesting um, because we are being asked to do something that um, every country I think is struggling with. Uh, and I wanted maybe then to, to take it to a next step and talk about the intersection between democracy, human rights, and economic activity and international engagement and trade. And um, again, I guess we go a, a, a tour de table of the, the three witnesses to say, um, do they see democracy and democratic rights as equal to uh, human rights or equivalent and a necessary uh, precursor for human rights? Or is it possible to have human rights in a non-democratic country? And I have no, I'm not leading, that's not a leading question. I'm really genuinely interested whether or not uh, you believe that human rights uh, can be protected in a system that is not the same as a democratic Canada. Do you have anybody you wish to start with? We'll go reverse order to the last one, just to be fair. All right, then, uh, uh, Ms. Tathong, you'll start. No, I don't think that it's possible to have, um, to really have uh, human rights, human rights protections, true respect for human rights in a non-democratic country. I just, I think that's what uh, some of these authoritarian leaders or, you know, the PRC government would want us all to believe it's possible and that there's just a different culture, a different way of doing things that somehow uh, cultural and social and somewhere rooted in history, but I don't think that's true. Um, I think that's just a really good excuse and a quick way to try to shut people up. Um, I think we see Chinese themselves Tibetans, everywhere you look at these closed societies where there is no um, true democracy, uh, you, you see people calling for it and asking for it in China to think in the Xi Jinping era that the, uh, the first sort of protest in that COVID lockdown period where the man put the banner on the bridge and and openly said we don't want a king we want democracy we want rights okay. i mean just because my time's limited i want to go to the yeah, next that, that person that to me is just that's the key that's the answer okay miss wang um i don't think i can improve what Laden has said, um, I think um, the Chinese government would say that they are perfect in protecting human rights. It's um, basically a lot of propaganda we see around the world from uh, Lebanon to Sudan. I, I, to... I know your, your opinion on that. I'm asking whether or not you believe that it is possible ever to have human rights protected in a non-democratic country. No, I don't think so. Okay. All right, thank you. And... Um... Um, Mr. Mehdi. Mr. Mehdi. Yes, I mean, this applies so very well to India today. The Indian government calls itself as the mother of democracy. And as I have pointed out, that it is not possible to have universal human rights when the real democracy, which India is not today, as many observers have written in 2014, India becomes a de facto Hindu nation. And in 2019, it becomes a de jure Hindu nation. And Thank 2024, we are all, we're already talking about making it, making a change in the constitution. So Thank that is you. I, 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 right I, now. I wanted to raise those points because I thought that's probably what you would say. And I wanted to draw it back to the Indo-Pacific strategy, which uh, says uh, the IPS will support efforts towards democracy, inclusivity, accountable governance, and sustained economic growth, helping key countries um, in the region. So I think underneath the uh, IPS and its, its value statements are that we, we should be supporting the growth and emergency of democ emergence of democracy uh, in those countries. So I wanted to ask you, and I've got a, about two minutes, or not even, uh, any thoughts on how best Canada can promote democracy, if we could move it to that one? And uh, uh, we can go to uh, Ms. Wang to start. Um. That's, that's a very long-term vision, I think, for, for China. Um, I think at this moment, with Xi Jinping in power, 
Um, we are going to have a very tough one um, inside China. Um, nonetheless, I would start with making sure the Chinese government face consequences for crimes against humanity. Now, we saw in the last two decades, the Chinese government keeps pushing that line, pushing that line, and it never got enough pushback from other governments. And so it can say, well, I can do whatever I want. And here we are. If it does not get account accountable for crimes against humanity, I fear to think what comes next. Thank you. How that leads then to democracy. I'm just, I, I'm not opposed to doing what you say, but if democracy is required for human rights, how does that lead to more democracy in your, in your logic? I think a government that has to be forced to be held accountable for something like crimes against humanity emboldens the people on the ground who think, wait, this isn't the way a government should behave. We already see these white paper protests. We see an emergence of consciousness of feminism in China that includes half of the population. The Chinese government cannot put these kind of consciousness down forever. And I expect that a strong principled standing up for human rights can have knock-on impacts. I'm not guaranteeing it, but I'm saying that they are important for people to push for that over time. This is a longer-term struggle. You see the Chinese people doing that over generations. Thank you, Ms. Wang. Now, uh, we'll go to Mr. Bergeron for six minutes, but I wanted to make sure our uh, guests on uh, Zoom know where the translation is, unless you've got really good French. Uh, and it's that little uh, globe that you see in the bottom, almost in the middle of the screen. Uh, you click on that and you have your option of uh, floor, English, or French. So if you want to make that adjustment, uh, Mr. Bergeron, you're off for your six minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chair. I would like to thank the witnesses for being with us today and helping enlighten us on the situation, notably in China, but also in regard to the Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. Human Rights Watch published in 2003 on its website, and I quote, that since uh, 2017, the Chinese government has systematically and generously targeted Uyghurs and also inhabitants of Xinjiang and are responsible for arbitrary detention, torture, disappearances and mass surveillance, cultural and religious persecution, family separations, forced labor, sexual violence and attacks on reproductive rights. In 2021, Human Rights Watch estimated that these actions constituted crimes against humanity. And a number of bodies, including the Canadian Parliament, deemed that this was uh, literally genocide. And the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations issued a report stating extreme concern. Also, according to Human Rights Watch in Tibet, authorities have established lots of uh, prohibitions on religion as well as repression and also doing away with uh, the mother tongue in primary schooling and the simple fact of contacting, this is true for Uyghurs too, uh, the Kazakhs, the Turkmen, the simple fact of contacting Tibetans in exile could give rise to detentions. In the Indo-Pacific strategy, Canada indicates that it will continue to defend the universal rights, uh, including regard to Uyghurs, Tibetans, and other religious and ethnic minorities. Moreover, how do you do this? Well, we do this by avoiding the imports of products resulting from forced labor in Canada intends to provide more technical support to certain trademarks. And here I'm quoting the IPS, technical support to Indo-Pacific trade partners to implement provisions regarding work and forced labor. And Canada has not shown itself to be exemplary in that regard to date. And legislation arising from an MP was adopted, pr proposing a 
voluntary company statements in regard to forced labor, and the government was to come up with a much uh, more restrictive bill, but we're still waiting for that. Moreover, a simple directive was issued regarding uh, CBSA preventing the import uh, into Canada of products emanating from forced labor. So my question is simple to date. These measures appear to be ineffective. How can Canada claim it is a world leader and one likely to provide more assistance to Indo-Pacific partners in this regard to issues of forced labor? And my question is for all three witnesses. Thank you. Which uh, person would you like to uh, start with, uh, Mr. Bergeron? Well, we have Perhaps we can go in the order in which they gave their statements. Mr. Mehdi, Ms. Wong. Your comments first, and then uh, Ms. Wang, and then uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Theron. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll give it a little thought before I say something. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Mehdi? Uh, you're on mute, sir. Did you have something to uh, offer it by way of an answer? No, not as yet. Thank All you. All right, very good. Uh, Ms. Wang, then you're next. Yeah. Um, I mentioned in my testimony at the beginning that we welcome the Canada's ban on forced labor, but as you have put it, it's not adequate. Um, we recommend two things. One is that you adopt laws that has a presumption against imports from Xinjiang. Um, similar to the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in the U.S., um, because the, the forced labor that's taking place in Xinjiang is um, a, a region-wide government-sponsored forced labor system. The, sec the, the second thing is that we recommend that you pass a due diligence law that actually require companies to take action to address human rights abuses in their supply chain in Xinjiang and elsewhere. So I think those two things would go, um, you know, towards, um, you know, what, what you just described as um, Canada taking a, an important step as a leader in protecting human rights um, at the intersection of, of trade, um, imports, uh, uh, business, and also human rights. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Tethong, your uh, comments? <laughs> I think I'll just go a little more uh, to a broader approach here, which is I think what we need uh, on on the one hand is a much more public and un, sort of speaking to these issues, human rights abuses, speaking to all of this more clearly, more publicly, not being afraid, I feel, uh, you know, not being afraid to address these directly because it might upset Xi Jinping or offend uh, the Chinese Communist Party leaders, whoever it is we're dealing with. I think there are lots of good tactics and, and tools being rolled out and talked about, but I do think overall, and I see this kind of everywhere, there's a general, still this fear or this need to sort of, this belief we need to tiptoe around the CCP in all of our talk on human rights. And, you know, the, I just, I, I guess I would say it, it, the Chinese government can read us pretty clearly and they know that, you know, some of the measures, the initiatives that we take, our governments, they're, they're not as uh, robust as they could be. And they, at the same time, I think they know that if they just threaten to huff and puff and blow the house down, we all shrink back in fear. And I, I just, I think uh, the issue of human rights should just be one that's public, no more private backroom bilateral dialogues, but public pressure, uh, public discussion, and just to, you know, we, we lead by example, and also we telegraph, we signal to Chinese people and Tibetans and everyone who's watching from the other side, and they do see and hear what's happening um, outside, they will see that we're serious about it and that we're not afraid. They don't want us to be afraid of, of Xi Jinping and the rest. Uh, we need to be bolder in, in all of our approach and more public with all of it, too. Thank you for that. Uh, now to Ms. McPherson, you have six minutes. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you to all of the witnesses for being here and sharing this important testimony with us. You know, I, I, I'm struck by all of your testimony. I don't think there's anyone in this room that doesn't agree that, that the human rights abuses that we are seeing in, in both India and China are, are dire and that there needs to be more done. Um, and where I struggle is what we can do as, as Canadian parliamentarians, what are those, those concrete pieces that can be, that can be done? Um, so I have some questions for each of you based on on your on your testimony that I'd I'd like to to start with, and I I think what I'll do is perhaps start with you, Miss Wang. You know, you spoke about forced labor and the forced labor legislation that Canada has. Well, to be perfectly honest, from my perspective, we do not, in fact, have forced labor legislation. Um, S-211 was a bill that was brought forward that basically says that folks that corporations or companies have to tell us if they think that there is um, forced labor within their supply chains. There are no implications on that. There's nothing that has to be done uh, to stop that from happening. So I do think that there is some real need for us to strengthen that. We also have an ombudsperson. I've spoken many times about the toothless ombudsperson, uh, the core ombudsperson who does not have the ability to, to compel testimony or witness and is not able to do uh, the job that, that 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 office needs to do, or the the job that that office was promised um, when when this particular government put that in place, you know, you you spoke about the fact that we've prioritized economic development and security over human rights. I'm I'm wondering though, you know, what are those concrete steps that Canada could take that that China would actually see that would listen to because we we have called out the weaker genocide within this parliament uh we have written about what's happening in tibet within this committee we have done these studies and we we have spoken quite strongly so the a concrete thing that this parliament or that this government could do that would that the that China would hear, that they would be able to, the PRC would actually listen to us on. If you could give me, you know, that one thing, and I, and I know you brought up, brought up monitoring harassment and whatnot, what's the one thing you'd like us to be taking action on on that? Would you like to yeah, direct um, your question? Uh, oh, is somebody going to volunteer to go first? It was for Ms. Wang. Oh, for Ms. Wang, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. I, I, I think, you know, um, I, I was definitely being polite with the uh, forced labor um, uh, ban quote. Um, you don't have to be polite in this in this committee. We're OK. I, you OK. Can take it. OK. No, but I, I, I think, you know, it's always I, I do think that governments, there are other governments would do less unfortunately so i think we duly recognize some of the efforts however little at the beginning um we, we asked for them to be to be more um so basically with the chinese government i don't think we are asking for a silver bullet i i I doubt there is one um <laughs> and and we are building many different pieces together that changes the narrative of how the Chinese government is being treated and discussed. Um, Laden talked about how, you know, suddenly when it comes to China, everybody shakes in fear. I think that kind of feeling of shaking in fear has become a little bit less. I think more governments are willing to confront the Chinese government. Um, but confronting means, for example, mainstreaming human rights. We are talking about human rights in a human rights, you know, hearing. However, often we are in this place rather than talking with, you know, people who are talking about national security. Um, if you look at the spending on national security and the spending on human rights, well, I think that all tells you how much these issues matter to government. So, you know, mainstreaming human rights, um, making sure human rights are raised at the highest level. You know, often we see, you know, governments when they go and talk with the Chinese government, human rights are, measured, are mentioned at some kind of separate human rights dialogue rather than when um, you know, the, the, the uh, top leaders going to talk with Xi Jinping and mentioning that at front and center. So those are things along with laws being changed, you know, on forced labor that would have an impact. Now, if you ask me one thing you should you should do tomorrow, um, I, I would still consider crimes against humanity as a very important uh, one to, um, to to focus on, because I think with time passing, especially 
this is going to sound somewhat, uh, uh, you know, not satisfactory, obviously. Um, for example, crimes against humanity. The, the, the UN, um, at the United Nations, um, the, the UN High Commissioner came out with a report saying that there may be crimes against humanity. They documented a lot of the, uh, the, the violations that took place as much as Human Rights Watch did in 2022, two years ago. That was the previous High Commissioner. The current High Commissioner has not briefed the Council about the report, has not spoken can follow up the, with the report. And it's because, well, the High Commissioner feared the Chinese government. Yeah. Um, you know, so Canada could take the lead at the Human Rights Council to press the High Commissioner to say, well, we need to talk about this. We need to have a joint statement. I know these are very low bar, but these are building blocks towards holding the Chinese Something government else. accountable. Yes, thank and, you. And I will try to get uh, just one more question in. Mr. Thong, it's nice to see you. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. It'd be nice to see you in person again. It's lovely that you're you're back at our at our committee. Um, you know, the, 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 we spoke about the Human Rights Council and wanting to get them to, to hold China more accountable for, for the human rights abuses that are happening there. But we also see China, you know, the China, the PRC spreading influence within Sub-Saharan Africa, within the Belt and Road Initiative. How, how does how does Canada push on that? How do we make sure that countries are uh, bravery might not be the right term, but but you know what I mean? Like that we want countries around the world in Sub-Saharan Africa, in other other parts of the world, to be standing up and saying what China's doing is wrong. It's very difficult to do that when China is the only one investing in infrastructure and development projects within those countries. How do, how do we manage that? Now, Ms. McPherson, you have just uh, gone way over time. Uh, however, Sorry. Mr. Thong, if uh, you I do have a Mr. brief Thong answer to uh, provide, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to sound a little repetitive, but I, I think the if the sort of like-minded nations, if Canada, the U.S., the U.K., Australia, if if all of these nations um, can speak, not just you know taking action in the UN together, but speak m m each individually more clearly, directly with China and publicly, so that other nations can see it, and so that. Chinese people can see and hear it, and so Tibetans can see and hear it. I think that is critical because as of, yes, I agree with Maya, there's a stronger approach in general now. I feel like it's, I mean, there's no other option at this point, and people are, governments are far more willing to say, to say something about transnational repression because it applies right at home, so therefore it's really clear. But I think we shouldn't shy away from the idea talking about democracy, talking about um, uh, you know genocide potential, you know crimes against humanity, all of these things in really public and pressuring sort of painful ways. I mean, I think this is one the biggest success that China has had, the PRC has had over all these say past two three decades was driving all of that conversation into the dark and out of the spotlight. And so, like, I see in so many ways, Canada is, it, these, these discussions are happening, it's excellent, they're much more public, but, you know, our leadership, this, the uh, highest officials in the Canadian government, the Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, we need to see really clear and strong language on all of, on all of this, human rights, Tibet, uh, the Uyghur genocide, all of it, really up front and not... Um, Mm, not as like a sidebar issue, but as like core and integrated into the conversation every step along the way and, and, and benchmarks and measures and, and we can hold the Chinese government account accountable. One of my colleagues says this best. He says, excuse me, Ms. Tepong, they need I, us. we did need a, a shortish answer and we got kind of yeah, a longish sorry. answer. We do have to go on to our next questioner and that would be I Ms. Lansman for sure. five minutes. Ms. Tarong, I'll, I'll let you continue that after. I'm going to start first with um, um, Ms. Wang and, and thanks for joining us. Um, Ms. Wang, last year um, the uh, the UK released its uh, its China policy. I was just wondering if you can. Uh, I, I know that you looked at it. Um, what works? What doesn't work? What can What should Canada uh, adopt? Sorry, you're asking about the UK yep. China policy. Okay. Um, I have to say, I don't think I have have you know studied it in detail. Um, in general, the UK approach um, 
to China, like many other governments, have not been um, totally consistent or satisfactory, especially with regard to its special obligations to Hong Kong, um, where it, it, it you know, made statements condemning, for example, the imposition of the security legislation, the second one, Article 23, but it has not imposed consequences. Um, we are asking for talking about, you know, concrete steps um, targeted sanctions on Hong Kong Chinese officials that were responsible for this um, security legislation. Hong Kong officials, unlike Chinese officials, do travel abroad, have families abroad. Um, these kind of sanctions will have will send the right message to the Chinese government that um, repression has a cost. I, I sorry, I. So I, I must have been mistaken. You you were quoted in saying um, that the UK needed a more ambitious plan to reduce uh, overall economic dependency. That's that's what I got from your uh, from your analysis of uh, of the of um, of the UK foreign minister's speech last year. So we're mm -hmm. talking about concrete actions, um, and perhaps you can be more detailed about what you meant or what you mean or what the UK could um, uh, we, what lessons we can take from the UK. Uh, with particular uh, focus on, econ on on reducing that economic dependency. Yeah, uh, sorry, because we, we actually ask governments to do many things. So um, I, I think that um, there is a difficulty among many governments when the Chinese government is at the same time is major, you know, it's dependent on the Chinese government on its critical supply chains. Um, and that has led to many of them essentially being unable to take concrete and, um, you know, serious actions on human rights. So for us, um, these issues are connected and that a, a move towards de-risking are, I think, you know, e either on, on critical supply chains or more broadly are important um, or linked to the promotion of um, human rights. Now, there are going to be questions or difficulties with regard to ensuring that, you know, the economy and, and trade relations continue to, I think, uh, you know, uh, important for, for the bilateral relations. But I, I think this... Uh, we cannot promote human rights without also looking at the impact trade and um, economy it must be built on the foundation of a healthy human rights, um, you know, relations. So this is where I think um, that recommendation comes from is that we cannot divorce these issues completely. Is is there really specific elements that you can uh, you can point to uh, in terms of uh, uh, of what what could work in uh, in the UK and what we could would would emulate here? Um, I think one of the, you know, I think some of those recommendations are already taking place. For example, I do think, for example, governments like Germany have looked at how their economy is dependent on, um, you know, the Chinese government, basically, because the Chinese government controls access to the country. Um, and therefore, I think there have been some effort to seek um, addressing those. Um, and I would say that some kind of review on how the Chinese government has been using um, these kind of economic leverage to make sure governments do not speak on human rights issues, either in Canada or globally, are important. Now, going beyond that, there would be many different kind of implications um, that needs to be carefully studied um, to, you know, to balance kind of the, the intention to promote human rights and, um, you know, to protect people's livelihood. So um, I think that is perhaps needed to, to in, the, in the first place, to make sure that your foreign policy is, you know, essentially decided by people in Canada, not by the Chinese government. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wang. Uh, we will now go to uh, Ms. Yip for five minutes. My question is to <clears throat> Ms. Letang. Um, I think 
uh, you have mentioned, uh, you highlighted the fact that China does not engage with other democracies. So that makes it very challenging for nations like Canada to have a meaningful impact. How can the UN and other like-minded uh, democracies work with China to engage in a dialogue? Is it even possible? So I think, I mean, they do engage. Um, I think the key is to set up the terms of the engagement that, so on the question of human rights, I think the bilateral human rights dialogues are, should have now shown themselves to be um, mostly powerless and ineffective. And uh, I think one thing governments, nations can do is tell the Chinese they're not going to engage uh, in a private backroom discussion on human rights, that, that the human rights discussions need to be more robust, perhaps, I don't know, in, in, in ways with other governments involved. I was just actually thinking of this in terms of how Canada, what could Canada do right now? One thing we've talked about a lot is the Chinese government wants you to address, their PRC government wants you to address all of our issues sort of separately and as if they're separate and distinct and, you know, keep us all in our various silos. So, um, Tibetans might be a religious freedom issue or a separatist issue for them, a uh, uh, question of, you know, terrorism and all this other nonsense and for the Uyghurs. And uh, so I, I feel like addressing all of our issues together in some way, creating some body or some group to do that more um, signally to them that, you, that you're in it for the long term and you want to talk about the Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, Hong Kongers, you know, all of our, as we've all sort of been, um, uh, especially in recent times, they've tried to enforce the silence over our communities through transnational oppression and then by shutting off our regions or clamping down in our, um, in our nations and in our territories. I think addressing our issues together and seeing where the themes are and the commonalities and, and all of that, Again, it sounds like it's not that much, but it is a way to sort of seek solutions, to discuss our issues together, to look for solutions together. Certainly as, a, as movements, Tibetans, Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, we've been, um, uh, and Chinese rights activists, we've been, yeah, working, having to work together for some years now and finding a lot of common ground and a lot of learning and um, strength in, in our solidarity. I think there's nothing probably the PRC government would like you to do less than get together and talk about our issues together and look for uh, ways to to address them as one, so that they're not they're not sort of broken up and treated as just an issue here, an issue there, but they're core to you know the treatment of um, all of our children, for example, in these in these residential boarding schools. They also exist in in uh, East Turkestan or what China calls Xinjiang. Um, and uh, also for Southern Mongolians, or what China calls Inner Mongolia. So there, right there is one, one area that Canada could, you know, our Canadian government could, could look at uh, as a whole. And when you start to see that whole picture, then you see that it's not an accident and it's not, you know, an un unintended consequence that most of all of our children and our future generations are in these um, genocidal school systems and and there's there's uh, when you first power um, answered the question you mentioned something about um back room or behind the scenes do you feel that diplomatic efforts behind the scenes uh, could make a similar impact in, in trying to improve the dialogue i i, I think the Discussions on human rights or on our issues just need to happen in in more public ways now because most of the discussion has been private. Um, of course, there are always measures and and there's a strength in the in at certain moments in negotiating behind the scenes. But I think the um, I don't know. I I feel like at this point dealing with Xi Jinping and looking at at where, how far he has gone and taken China like off a cliff. Um, I think it, it's, we're really facing, it's like, it's desperate times <laughs> and we need more intense measures and more public measures and really um, 
I see a shift and it's great, but I don't feel like it's, it's enough. And I also don't think there, you know, there's still this idea that we'll be dealing with Xi Jinping and the communist party forever. And I just think that that is a flawed approach. I think we, our governments need to think about the future of China as, you know, Chinese people and rights defenders and who comes next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thong. We'll now go to Mr. Bergeron for two and a half minutes. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Chair. I would like to invite our witnesses to forget momentarily everything I said regarding all of uh, the attacks on the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, the Kazakhs, the uh, Falun Gong practitioners, and others. I would like to invite the witnesses to set aside what I said regarding Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy concerning the respect for human rights and uh, forced labor. Because the government has indicated that it intends to re-establish or normalize ties with the People's Republic of China, and we sent a parliamentary mission. We also sent the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. We also sent out the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs with the uh, mandate to normalize ties with uh, the PRC. And I'm asking the, of the witnesses, do you think that is consistent with everything we've talked about in the first round of questions? Who would you like to have answer, uh, Mr. Bergeron? Uh, we'll go with uh, Ms. Wang. Ms. Wang. Um, I'm not sure fundamentally, given the Chinese government's political system, a Leninist one, of top-down centralized control, um, even if, you know, human rights abuses ebb and flow, let's say, sometimes it gets better, sometimes it, it, it gets really worse. Um, whether or not any country can have a, quote, normalized relationship, stabilized relationship with China without essentially falling into the Chinese government's um, trap of language, essentially normalizing, stabilizing relationship with China often is code for playing by the Chinese government's rules. Um, we don't. Um, we don't want to see that because international human rights laws are international norms, which actually the Chinese government also signed up to. Chinese government is a signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. These are the rights that Chinese government and Chinese people in the constitution are promised. So we hope that we remember where the, the guiding principles or, or, or compass of those relationships are um, in, in your relationship with China. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wang. That's your time, uh, Mr. Bergeron. Uh, Ms. McPherson, your two and a half minutes now. Thank you very much. Um, one thing I want to ask all three of you actually to start with, we've heard from other human rights folks that have come and talked to this committee and to other committees. I used to sit on the International Human Rights Subcommittee, but also on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And, and the need for Canada ha to have a human rights strategy is something that we've heard from, from many advocates, many experts, um, a comprehensive human rights strategy. I'd like to start with you, Mr. Mehdi, because I didn't get to you in the last round. Can you, can you talk to me about the importance of this, whether or not you think this is something that Canada needs to undertake? Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I will add to that the, the, the use of this human rights committee, one of the roles could be to hold the government's accountable, all the governments accountable, at least in the international forums. One of the important international forums, as I mentioned in my presentation, is, is addressing the misuse of the anti-terror laws and the financial assistance, uh, financial action task force, the institution which is reviewing at this moment uh, the, the, the India, um, uh, it's called the Mutual Evaluation Review. I think Canada should show all these reports which I have referenced in my presentation from Amnesty International and from the Global Nonprofit Organization Coalition on the FATF. I think these are the very important things which India will have to answer in the international forum. Thank you. Ms. Wang? Um, I think you need a strategy. I think you need people to staff it. You need funding for it. Um, otherwise, it's just empty words. So I like to see 
that kind of comprehensiveness from Canada. Yeah, and and frankly, I think we've seen that with with our sanctions regime, which I'll ask you about in the next round if I get a chance. But 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 the idea that without enforcement, without funding, without um, staff for it, it it becomes um, a PR process instead of an actual meaningful strategy. Um, Mr. Thong. Yes, I think it's um, it's key for the continuity for you know um, from government to government, but also just in terms of infusing every discussion, like when I think of the, the, all the different ways are, you know, governments engage with China on, you know, national security issues, military security, regional issues, trade, economics, everything. I mean, human rights need to be throughout. And the only way you do that well is if you have a clear sort of cohesive idea of how and, 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 how and when to raise these issues, link them. And really, I agree with Maya. I mean, you can't do it without a good, um, well-staffed uh, department to, to follow through on it. But I think the more that human rights gets sort of chopped up and put, say, country by country or place by place, it, it just doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have teeth. And I think leaders like Xi Jinping know that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and as you I, pointed I, out, okay, we need to have out of time, oh, uh, <laughs> Mr. McPherson. Nice I'm really pushing the limit today. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Yeah, Chong. I know, I know. Nice try. Um, it's now Mr. Chong's turn for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the uh, one of the highlights in the Indo-Pacific strategy is the government of Canada's efforts to supporting democracy in the region. Um, if you look at uh, research from think tanks and other uh, research organizations, uh, what we noticed that is over the last decade and a half, uh, over the last two decades, there has been democratic backsliding in the region, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, in countries like Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, and, and other countries. Um, so my question uh, is simple. Uh, what should the Government of Canada be doing in practical, actionable terms uh, to strengthen democracy in those jurisdictions, seeing that they are of a size that Canada could have an influence in? Uh, with any of the, with all three of them, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, we'll start uh, with you, uh, Mr. Mehdi, and then we'll go to Ms. Uh, Tathong and then uh, Ms. Wang. Sure, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so I think it's a very important, as, as we all know, that there is no uh, cooperate, international cooperation development aid uh, between, between Canada and India. So that has cut a lot of dialogue people-to-people -people dialogue between uh, Canadian civil society organizations and human rights and civil society organizations in India. I know of a very few. I have been working in alternatives in the NGO sector since 30 years and more, and there was a lot of uh, exchanges between people-to-people -people exchanges, which not only shared and, and, and advocated with our specific our government, both provincial and the federal, uh, about the situations and what we think should be done to, to, to tell our governments and our representatives how to promote democratic institutions as a watch on what's happening in India. That is missing. So I think the Canadian government could invest in some kind of a platform uh, to open that dialogue again. That is missing a lot. And, and I noticed it personally in my career, uh, how it went down from a very uh, vibrant uh, exchanges to nearly zero exchanges happening today at the civil society level. I, I, guess, I, I guess, look, uh, you know, Thailand has a population of about 70 million. Uh, Myanmar has a population of about 55 million. Cambodia has a population of about 17 million. These are countries that are within an order of magnitude of the size of Canada's population. We also have economies uh, that are an economy in Canada that is much, much larger than countries like that, where we could have an outsized influence. And so 
you know, in practical terms for these, you know, the government's Indo-Pacific strategy acknowledges uh, that issue of scale. Um, it focuses particularly on the North Indo-Pacific in terms of economic strategy, um, focusing on places like Japan and South Korea. It has a special mention of diplomatic uh, um, outreach in uh, the island chains uh, in the Indo-Pacific. I think that's all predicated on an acknowledgement that Canada is not, you know, the world's largest uh, country by population, um, not the second largest country by population. And so, you know, with the limited resources we bring to bear, how can we use them most effectively um, in the region? Um, you know, the government has decided that with respect to certain areas of the strategy, there'll be a focus on the North Indo-Pacific. In other areas, uh, they've decided to focus on ASEAN. The question I have is, with respect to democratic backsliding, when it comes to Southeast Asia, the part of the Indo-Pacific that organizations like the Hudson Institute have identified as the greatest weakness, um, and particularly countries like Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia, what practical actions can the government take to uh, stop the backsliding and strengthen uh, democratic institutions in those areas, in those countries? Maybe we could go to uh, Madam Wong. Um, thank you. Um, I would, you know, I know that your to-do list is probably going to be very long and I could send you uh, human rights research reports from, you know, <laughs> decades before, with a very long to-do list. I would suspect that um, the region, we see democratic backsliding across the world at the same time as essentially um, a period of unprincipled um, international trade and economics, uh, you know, globalization, essentially, where where we see a, a growing inequality between the rich, um, uh, the richest and, and the workers, where, um, you know, you see China as exhibit A, where, you know, we, we used to talk, I think we used to hear, um, uh, you know, President Clinton talked about how, um, you know, as China grows, the middle class grows, and so will become it will become democratic. That wasn't true. What happened was the Chinese government becomes incredibly empowered. Um, I suspect, not an expert on all these other governments that you, um, you have to deal with, um, a lot of these governments also became rich and very powerful in a way that is um, authoritarian. I would suspect that some of the, you know, legislation that have to do with putting back human rights, putting back labor rights into international um, trade and globalization would go a long way towards addressing that kind of um, imbalance in power between the people and, and the government um, that can address broader issues beyond um, China and, and the region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Now to uh, Mr. Fragascatos for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chair, and to the witnesses. Uh, in the early 2000s, it was common, uh, not just in academic circles, but in foreign policy circles is where to champion the idea of democracy promotion. The concept basically said that if the world's to, world was to be stable, if we were to have peace as much as possible, then democracies should promote democracy as a concept in theory and practice at every opportunity because, among other things, no two democracies have ever gone to war against each other. So democracy is seen as exactly that as a stabilizing force. And it was built into the foreign policies of the United States, Canada even, other democracies as well made it a, a real focal point. But after the Iraq war, for reasons that, uh, that I think will be obvious, the idea fell out of favor entirely. Uh, and uh, out of that, in turn, came a view that if democracy was to be lasting, if it was to be, um, if it was to be achieved in a way that was uh, truly meaningful uh, and to, to be a stabilizing force, on its own, it would have to be organic. So the question that I have uh, builds upon what uh, Mr. Oliphant was raising earlier. Um, how can we, uh, as, um, as a middle power here in Canada, how can we best promote democracy in a way that does not impose, but allows for an organic movement towards it in authoritarian environments where Obviously, any democratic expression is extremely limited. And that's to all of you, whoever wants to begin. <laughs> 
I could sure. I could start. I, I actually want to take this moment to point to uh, publication by a friend, uh, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict and the Atlantic Council put out um, Hardy Merriman, uh, a colleague of ours, wrote a playbook for countering the authoritarian threat, fostering a fourth democratic wave. And it is all about investing in civil resistance and movements and in people. I think the key to me is that especially if you don't want it to be top down or, you know, one side lecture to the other is looking for the natural allies in those places. Sometimes it'll be an exile movement, like in the Tibetan case, often it's on people on the ground in most places in the world. There are still even those that are slipping more and more towards authoritarianism. There are still uh, people, movements, organizations, civil society groups that are the best defense, uh, both the long game and the short term um, to, to fight for rights and freedom and to create the societies that we want and need. And I think people, it's not always easy, but I think, you know, the answer, it's all, it's just so simple on one level. It does lie with the people. I think what this, um, uh, fostering a fourth democratic wave does is, is breaks it down and gives really clear ideas for new principles for engagement, places, governments can put funding, foundations, uh, you know, funding organizations in general. I think that there's been a problem where people have been afraid, governments have been afraid to talk about these things openly and to say really clearly that they're funding democratic uh, resilience, resistance, whatever it might be. Uh, and I don't think that helps anyone, especially the people on the ground in those places who most need even, you know, Canada is a country I know just from my travels and my work. I live in the U.S. now. I've traveled the world working on the Tibetan issue. Canada is looked to as a beacon by a lot of people all over the world. And if Canadians and the Canadian government and the Canadian parliament says things clearly, as I believe you are, but we could do a lot more of, that we cannot underestimate the importance of just being out there in front speaking and leading for okay. the morale of people to, in places like in Tibet. I'm sorry, Ms. Tithung, I only have yeah. about 40 seconds left. If we could hear from uh, from Ms. Wang, just because she's next on my list, uh, with all due respect to uh, Mr. Mehdi. Um, I, I would say that, first of all, um, Canada should not think about it imposing values on other people. People around the world have demonstrated with their lives on the line these values, they want them. The only people who are basically saying don't impose these values are generally the people who, you know, authoritarian governments, leaders who say, well, don't do not do that. Um, so, so I think it has to do with, you know, how we think about these issues. We want to, I think you want to think about them as Canada standing in solidarity. What would Canada do if you were standing on the democratic front line with these people facing some very seriously militarized police and, and army these days to crush them? What would Canada do? And I think the answer would come very easily to anyone. Um, Canada, like Germany and France, I think sometimes think of itself as a middle power. It, it's not when it comes to, you know, economic, um, what it stands for. It has a lot of potential, especially in U.S.-China competition, where I think it's not, I think Canada is not considered as kind of, you know, um, necessarily, you know, I think it, it becomes a little bit more problematic these days as the U.S., you know, uses human rights as a as a tool to to, to um, compete with China. But I think Canada has a different profile. So thank you. Very I would much. suggest you use it. Thank you. All right. So here's what we have. We have uh, 10 minutes left. Be time for one five minute round, which I'm going to give to. Mr. Erskine Smith, and then we'll split the last uh, five minutes between Mr. Bergeron and Ms. McPherson. So if you're ready, Mr. Erskine Smith, uh, the next five minutes are yours. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to start with uh, Ms. Wang and just close the loop on uh, forced labor legislation. And so uh, we have currently the Modern Slavery Act, which is more reporting obligations, uh, you pointed to the EU and to the U.S. in different ways. In Budget 2024, there's a commitment to introduce legislation in 2024 to eradicate forced labor from Canadian supply chains. So in the interest of time, uh, would you be able to, via Human Rights Watch, 
uh, provide both uh, in writing, pr provide commentary on what works in those other ju jurisdictions and where there are shortcomings in those jurisdictions with respect to that legislation so that it can inform Canadian approach in 2024. Absolutely. Great. Uh, with, res uh, with respect to uh, the Canadian Ombuds uh, Person for Responsible Enterprise, uh, we've seen specifically with respect to uh, the discrimination and as uh, the UN has put it, the, uh, the concern around crimes against humanity as against Uyghur Muslims. Uh, CORE has opened investigations just in the last year against uh, Walmart, Hugo Boss, Diesel Canada, Guess, uh, Levi Strauss, and in their very first determination uh, just recently, uh, they found that Uyghur forced labor likely took place uh, in respect of a mining operation. Of course, in that very first determination, uh, we learned what we already knew, which is uh, that CORE can only make recommendations and has no real teeth. Uh, in fact, the minister has more teeth in the Modern Slavery Act in relation to just reporting obligations uh, than the ombudsperson has with respect to actual human rights violations. Uh, so uh, is it your view, Ms. Wang, that in addition to any legislation to eradicate forced labor, we should actually, for once and, once and for all, empower the core with proper teeth? Um, I, I, I am not an expert of that particular institution, but from what you described, it, it sounds, well, I would agree that we need enforcement power for, you know, legislation that act against forced labor. Yes. Thanks very much. Uh, beyond taking action as a, uh, on the issue of forced labor, uh, I think Ms. McPherson put it well in with respect to the fact that you have a situation in Canada where Parliament not only debated the issue, but concluded uh, with a vote that uh, genocide has taken place as against Uyghur Muslims. Uh, the government has forcefully spoken out on a number of occasions. What, what more do you think we ought to do and do you think the government ought to do beyond forced labor legislation? Um, in addition to that, and I already spoke about um, the actions that should be taken at the UN, um, and it's coming right up in June, yeah. um, the next Human Rights Council session. Um, it's also we have further, we have a lot of recommendations from our report on Xinjiang, which I'm glad to share. Um, for example, that um, the Canadian government should encourage um, essentially, um, you know, preparation of criminal investigations into Chinese government officials responsible for um, crimes against humanity, um, preparing prosecution files, essentially. Um, we also encourage um, governments to document uh, missing, uh, the, the individuals who are still missing in the, in the region who are detained and imprisoned, um, press for the re for their release, obviously, and also some of them are actually families of, Ken uh, well, I think there are some families or... or um, there, there certainly are some families uh, connected oh. to Canadians. That it, can, there, there undoubtedly are. Uh, and there's actually one of the longest standing cases is uh, connected to Canada. What, uh, it, my, my last question is in, specifically in relation uh, to the Indo-Pacific strategy, because uh, very, you know, in black and white, uh, Canada has a strategy that is calling out the human rights abuses in China. It actually doesn't, I think, properly mention some of the challenges we face in the Canada-India relationship, but it clearly articulates the challenges in the Canada-China relationship. Uh, in, in, you know, I, I'm not going to ask you in less than a minute to do this, but again, if in writing, you can provide recommendations for how the Indo-Pacific strategy can be improved. And this applies to Mr. Mady and, and Ms. Tathong, but if there are specific, specific improvements that you would like to see in the strategy as it currently uh, is laid out. Uh, I would appreciate you providing that to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Erskine Smith. Uh, we now have uh, two and a half minutes for Mr. Bergeron. Si vous me le Thank you. If you'll allow me, Chair, I'll continue where I left off earlier because only Ms. Wong had the opportunity to speak on the question I asked regarding Canada's intentions to normalize relations with the People's Republic of China. So I would like to hear from Ms. Tetong and perhaps Mr. Mehdi also in this regarding the possibility of normalizing ties with a dictatorship such as the one that reigns in the People's Republic of China. Madam Tetong? Ms. Tetong? Yeah, I... Um I don't think it's possible to normalize relations with 
China, the People's Republic of China, especially under Xi Jinping, um, I think that the future, you know, his future, the Communist Party's future is very, very uh, at risk and unclear at this moment. I think I heard someone describe it recently, like there are eight loaded weapons facing them. And it's just a question of which one goes off first, um, you know, whether it's demographics, whether it's uh, uh, the internal um, issues, w w the, the economy, banking, all of it. So I think for Canada to, if we can think more of Xi Jinping and the Chinese government at this moment, like in the Russia and Putin terms and think of where we're going to be and what it's going to look like. I think change is coming faster than we realize. Um, and it's going to be probably uh, upon us before we know it. And so to think now and very clearly and dig into who is there, what are the movements, where are the people, what can we support, what are the plans? I think that's more of a, of a, of a, of a safe strategy moving forward than looking to normalize relations. I think my colleague, I didn't get to say earlier, my colleague from Tibet with 35 years of experience in the education system and who is following all of this every day from the Tibetan perspective and in Chinese uh, internal discussions and conversations, he's, his read is that, you know, it's all going to come to a head very, very soon and that no one's really ready for it. And I think, um, the way that Xi Jinping's been behaving lately and the fact that he's coming out is because he, as my colleague says, he needs us. He's here because he is weak. And all we do is make him strong when we keep giving him the legitimacy and giving him the platforms that um, don't challenge him, but rather in a way just accept him in the way that Putin used to be built up uh, and accepted. So I don't know. I, I, I think it's, I don't think you can have normal relations with this uh, People's Republic of China, the, the PRC government, and especially Xi Jinping, and, and, and those are who are in power right now. Thank you, Mr. Thong. Uh, your two and a half minutes are up. Uh, we'll go to Ms. McPherson for our last two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, what you were just talking about, Mr. Thong, that just resonates with me so much, you know, supporting movements, the the fact that you called out the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict is is. Wonderful. Thank you for, for bringing forward, for giving that, um, acknowledging the amazing work that they that they do. Um, I'll just finish with a very simple question. I know all three of you have spoken about the potential for sanctions to play an important role. Um, I've been quite critical about the way the government has um, enforced our sanctions, but I'd like to ask each one of you, are there are there individuals that are not sanctioned by Canada yet that should be sanctioned? Um, do you have um, any suggestions for us with regards to the sanction regime? Maybe I'll start with you, Mr. Mendy. Uh, I, I cannot talk about the sanctions of individuals. Uh, I can only say that in India, we are talking uh, about the backsliding of democracy in the region, in the Indo-Pacific region. I mean, India to begin with has a very robust and an excellent constitution adopted in 1950. But since 2014 coming to power of this regime, there is a very serious backsliding in the democratic institutions. So I think if we need to address this and stop this backsliding. And if you are watching the elections going on in India these days, there is a very open announcement of a fight between democracy and dictatorship. So I think this is the issue for India today. And the government, which is a majority government today, let's hope it's not in the next elections after June, uh, should be called out for the abuse of its human rights and should be question in the international platforms. Thank you. Ms. Wang? Um, um, unfortunately, I don't have a ready list for you, though there are, you know, lists um, that other Hong Kong groups, for example, I have spoken about the importance of sanctioning Hong Kong officials. Mm -hmm. the, the list runs really long, but I would say the timing. I would like to see, you know, 
it's a little bit late for Article 23, but still, it's, it's still timely. And then when um, the, the um, sentences will be handed down to um, the pro-democracy media tycoon, Jimmy Lai, when um, the 47 pro-democracy, uh, you know, legislators, ex-legislators will be, um, uh, you know, have the sentences handed down. I want to see that kind of response by at least sanctions. Thank you. Yeah. And, and finally, Mr. Fung. Yeah, accountability is everything. And I think in Tibet in particular, the party secretaries uh, and also in the case of the boarding schools, the intellectual architects of the policy that seeks to openly, blatantly um, so-called assimilate, but, you know, forcibly assimilate um, Tibetan children and also Uyghur children and Southern Mongolians. I think all these people should be held accountable. And I think in particular, Right now is a moment to use sanctions and to deepen our use of them as a tool, because if you think of the divisions inside the Communist Party and the way that breaks down across all of China and Tibet and East Turkestan or Xinjiang, then you have a lot of leaders right now, Chinese leaders in the system, wondering where their future lies or, uh, you know, what's going to, how it's all going to shake out in the, in, in the end. And if we want to put pressure on Xi Jinping for these terrible policies, the ethno-nationalism, all of that. Um, and, you know, of course, we want to try to pressure him to stop them, stop these policies. But in, it, at least now we can be signaling to all of those people, you don't want to be involved in this. In the future, is this who you want to be aligned with? I mean, there has to be a cost for them now and in the future. And I think sanctions are one of the only uh, tools we have to really make that clear. The U.S. has imposed visa sanctions on uh, Chinese leaders involved in the boarding school system in Tibet, the colonial boarding school system. And I think um, Canada could also and should also uh, uh, think about engaging in this way. And we do have the party secretaries are the very obvious people because they are in charge of the CCP policy as it is implemented in all of Tibet, though they've carved it up into the Tibet Autonomous Region and other autonomous, so-called autonomous regions. Um, and then the intellectual architects, we are actually working more to try to make a clearer picture of, of what um, and who's, who's responsible there. Thank you very much. You. So we've come to the end of uh, the testimony from our witnesses, and I'd like to thank all three of you. Uh, actually, starting with you, uh, Mr. Thong, you mentioned that one of your colleagues had written a book about democracy, and I'm wondering if uh, you could uh, email our clerk with the details of that book. It, it sounds quite fascinating, so thank you for being I with do. us. Uh, Ms. Wang, it was uh, good to have you on, as well as uh, you, Mr. Mehdi. Uh, we will now... Um, well, we'll let our, our witnesses go about whatever the rest of their day looks like. We will pause for a few minutes while we go in camera and take care of some committee business. Thank you very much for your time.